Welcome to the St. Giles Sermon Podcast. This week we are reading from the Old Testament and the New. We begin in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, starting at verse 18. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. To give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. We turn now to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, starting at verse 4. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, Grace and peace to you from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. We turn now to the Gospel of John, chapter 18, starting at verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. Those words were written by T.S. Eliot in the poem Little Gidding, and it was written in the 1940s, at a time when he was recovering from illness, living in a country at war, which inspired much of the content and the imagery in this poem. And these words which we have read today ring true now, especially as we turn the page on a new year. Whether we're rebuilding from a war or building something new now, endings are in many ways beginnings, especially and perhaps even more so when they're not particularly welcome. We as people move through seasons of change and transition, and some of these transitions are really good. They're marked with beautiful feelings. You've got joy and expectancy, perhaps. But then there's also loss. As you leave behind what was and move into what will be, our biggest challenge as people seems to be letting go and moving forward. Letting go, especially when you're an adult, is really hard. Children seem to have a great capacity for moving into the unknown. You probably can remember moments in your own life when you were more like a child and you thought, yes, the world is my oyster. And now you want to crawl back right up on into that 10-year-old body, right? When the world felt like all was possible. 
The thing is, as adults, we can see more of the possibilities in the realm of negativity than kids allow themselves to do. And so we tend to dwell on what was. Because what was is known and comfortable, and we have a hard time moving into what will be, especially if we don't know what that contains. But God calls us on this through his prophet Isaiah when he says, do not dwell on the things of the past. See, I am doing a new thing. I'm getting excited, and I'm not even the one who said it, right? It's just like I'm doing a new thing. It springs up. Don't you perceive it? God's words there just get me excited. I don't know if they get you excited. Perhaps not, because change is not easy. But as we move towards this season of Advent, in a season where we remember and we celebrate the newness of life and the gift of God with us, I think we must remember to start at the end with Christ as King. Before we remember that he came as a child, we need to know why that matters. All babies are wonderful, don't get me wrong. They're lovely. But no child except this child is one we celebrate with such deliberate fashion. Why this matters to us, why this child is important, is simply because of who he becomes. It's Jesus becoming our king. It's Jesus being born for us and his willingness to walk as a human with us, to share in our joys and our sorrows, to share in life as it happened, to get colds and feel unwell, to feel miserable because you've walked all day. At points, he would have fallen into bed just like we do. And he was willing to do that and more as he walked to that cross. Through death, to life, for us. That's what makes what is to come important. But before we can celebrate that, we must perceive it. We must embrace it. And so we look into the future of that child. And we remember what will be as a result of his coming. God is always doing new things, calling us to look and pay attention. And paying attention is not easy in a world with so many distractions. We have the most distracted generation of people alive I think, ever today, for good reason. We are a people who know how to entertain ourselves. If you are creative, you can paint, you can knit, you can crochet, you could do woodworking, you could do wood burning, you could do all kinds of things, right? If you are more of an analytical kind of mind and you're more interested in problem solving, there are endless problems to solve. There's lots of fixing to be done. We are distracted. And I haven't even mentioned our technological distractions. We seem more and more capable of distracting ourselves every day than ever before. So how do we pay attention to the stuff that God is doing when our own desires and needs and temptations assault us on every front? How do we see really see what God is doing in this world when we spend so much time being the center of action that we've lost sight of what is around us. Well, we begin at the end, right? We look at the end and we say, is that where I want to go? We see Jesus at the end, which is a beginning in our gospel lesson today. We meet him in the moment when Pilate and he are discussing who he is and what he came to do. And Jesus says, I have come to testify to the truth, to give evidence to what is true. And that is something we must remember. 
as those who live on the other side of the resurrection, who continually wait in expectation for the next entertainment, the next thing to distract us, we must remember what matters. We must pause in the midst of what is ramping up already to be the busiest Christmas yet. I mean, Black Friday sales have been going on for three weeks, right? It's, it's crazy. What used to be one day is now an entire month of sales and ads and all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. In this season, who are we? What are we? I think this is the important thing for us to remember as we walk towards what is to come. We must remember who we follow, what it is we say we believe. We must remember that the evidence, the testimony Christ gave was different from what this world knew. And as we seek to walk in truth, his testimony, the living word, has invited us into that work, into the work of living differently into the work of laying down our desires, our longings, our hopes, so that truth might reign and be shared with all people. Life with God is endlessly exciting because God is doing new things all the time. The question is, do we have the courage necessary to walk into those new things? We may not, but God's strength gives us that courage if we rely on it. Life with God is a life of constant motion, a life of service, a life where we wait expectantly for God to arrive, where we move in this world and say, God will come, and God has come. And God is near. So as we move into this season of lights and sparkle, as we move into the reality of a world that is distracted, what will we bring with us? Let us bring our knowledge of who he is of what we are actually waiting for, the living word who reigns for us, over us, and is, in fact, for us. He is on our side, working with us to create a world that is God's world, that aligns with the vision of what humanity could be, filled with possibility, filled with what is beautiful. Now, the reality of working with God is it's not always comfortable. Sometimes it's easier to slide on right into what is happening around us. But when we follow God's way, transformation comes. For the world, yes, and for us. So as we wait together, as we wait through this season of expectation, as we wait on the one who comes to serve and to save, as we prepare to sing songs like joy to the world, let us remember what that song actually says. It's not about Jesus as a child at all. When we sing joy to the world, the Lord has come, we're singing about Jesus, our Savior. As we move into the season of expectation and we say to each other, peace on earth, will we take with us the message that Jesus brought where he said, I have not come to bring peace. Jesus came to testify to truth. Are we willing to testify to truth when it rocks boats? Are we willing to speak truth in areas that make others uncomfortable? Are we willing to be a living difference in this world and differentiate ourselves from, you know, 
the comfortable wave of societal movement and stand in Christ's truth? Do we acknowledge who Jesus is in the midst of the celebrations? And do we give praise to our God who is, who was, and always will be? Who doesn't necessarily give us what we want, but gives us what we need, which is truth, a way, and life in him. Eugene Peterson, the translator of the Message Bible, who happened to be a Presbyterian pastor, so he must have been okay, right? Said once this of praise. He said, the only genuine, authentic, and deep praise is ever, or the only way genuine, authentic, and deep praise is ever accomplished is by embracing what is real, by accepting whatever takes place and living through it as thoroughly as we are able in faith, for in those moments, in those passages, we become human. Jesus came to testify to the truth, and when we accept truth, when we live in truth, when we walk in truth, we become truly human and truly able to praise our God, regardless of the circumstances. We are to be disciples. We are to follow Christ. Now, have you ever thought of what a disciple really is? Or do you just think it's those guys who follow Jesus around? It's okay if you do. Most people, if you say the word disciple, instantly think Peter, James, John, those guys, right? But a discipler is actually a follower of a particular leader or philosopher or teacher. You can be a disciple of anyone. And there are many disciples of many different people. And in our lives, Jesus asks us to be a disciple of him. Jesus invites us to follow him and believe in him, but follow him as we believe. And as disciples in this world, we are to faithfully live as he lived, to testify to truth, to live in hope and imagine a better world while working for that. The tension between what is now and what could be is something that should weigh heavily on our hearts. As we, the people of God, who keep God central in our lives, should be noticing the things that need changing. We should be unafraid to speak truth to power. And we should be willing to get our hands dirty, up to the elbows if necessary, doing the work of building God's kingdom. We are to see what others do not and live in his way. God says, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? God is doing new things. Do you perceive them? Dallas Willard once wrote, and Dallas Willard, if you're wondering, was a great philosopher. And if you haven't read Dallas Willard, you should. But he once wrote that the greatest need facing the world today is whether those who are Christians will become disciples. I think that's a good thought for us to mull over as we move into Advent, as we move into waiting expectantly for Christ to come. It's a good thought for those who believe in him because we need to look at our lives and say, do we believe in Christ? Or do we believe and then follow him? We are to follow Jesus, to follow his life, to study his teachings, to learn from them, to get as close to Jesus as humanly possible and apply his knowledge to our lives. And when we fail, which we will, we keep going. How do we know that? When you read the Gospels, his disciples fail regularly. And they don't get kicked out. Jesus pulls them closer and says, you still haven't learned this yet. Okay, let's try again. We learn from Jesus. We retreat into prayer. 
We follow him into the world, into service and healing and help. We keep on keeping on in the way of Christ, regardless of the circumstances, determined to follow his example as we deny ourselves, as we take up our cross and follow him. So before you turn the page on your calendar and embrace all that is about the season of wonder and expectation, I want you to remember that there was a servant king who came and laid down his life for you, who testified to the truth and who invited you into the same work. I want you to remember that he was determined to show people another way of living. And he was the way in which God loved this world not taking the power that was rightfully his, but instead laying it down and serving all who came to him. We are God's people, called to be living witnesses of another way, a way of truth, as we seek to serve the one who is, who was and always will be, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, So let us begin at the ending, and in so doing, end up at a new beginning for us all.